everyone, and welcome to the podcast. Are you kidding me? We are broadcasting to you today from the studios of the Manhattan Institute, home of City Journal's 10 Blocks podcast, which you can find on the Manhattan Institute website or wherever you get your podcasts. I am Naomi Schaefer Riley. I'm a resident fellow at the American Enterprise Institute. And I'm Ian Rowe, visiting fellow at the American Enterprise Institute. And today, Ian, you have brought a guest with you, so I was hoping you might be able to introduce her. Yes, I'm so proud to introduce the Chief Executive Officer of Spence Chapin. Her name is Kate Trumbetskaya. And before I go any further, full disclosure, I actually have the honor and privilege of being Chairman of the Board of Spence Chapin. Spence Chapin, for those of you who are not aware, is, is one of the oldest adoption agencies in the country. Over the last 100 years, we've worked with more than 25,000 birth mothers to form more than 20,000 families looking at what was the best situation for the birth mother where they made voluntary decisions to place their child either in an adoptive loving family or to become a parent themselves. And it's an incredible track record and we're very pleased to have Kate with us. Thank you so much. I'm really excited to be here. We wanted to sort of start today by kind of getting like a little bit of the lay of the land. So Spence Chapin is a private adoption agency. So tell us a little bit about that, because we often talk on this podcast about foster care and adoption out of foster care. So what is the difference between public and private adoption? Spence Chapin, as Ian had mentioned, has been around for over 100 years. It's a New York City institution. And what we do at Spence Chapin, we work with birth mothers who come to us in crisis to work out a plan regarding their parenting choice. And those options that we discuss with them include placing a child vis-a-vis a private adoption through Spence Chapin with a family that they themselves select or deciding to parent their child. So essentially what Spence Chapin does is offer women safe space to make an informed, voluntary, knowing decision about parenting or not parenting their child. It is completely different from the very adversarial nature of the foster care system. From the minute you meet a social worker that is in your home or a case planner who's executing either an emergency removal or removing the child from the home or recommending a court-ordered supervision proceeding, you're entering an adversarial arena. And that is the difference between, really the essential difference between the foster care system and what we do at Spence Chapin. So before we get into, I think, what's going to be like the domestic private adoption world, which we want to talk about today, you also are involved in international adoption. I wonder if you might say a little bit about that. I know that we have reached kind of all-time lows in terms of the number of international adoptions that Americans are doing. And, um, you know, if you can just talk about like a little bit of your work, what, what do you see as the big challenges and why you see those numbers going down so much? Yes, absolutely. I mean, the numbers, you know, we were 20,000 intercountry adoptions in 2004. Today, as a nation, we're doing 4,000 adoptions. And it's, you know, the number of orphans continues to increase worldwide. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. It's not as if the number of available um, children yeah, the need is decreasing is still there. Yeah. It's, it's, and growing, in fact. Yes. And Spence Chapin, as an organization themselves, have done 4,000 intercountry adoptions during our time, which just shows you how the need continues to exist and how bureaucracy and various bodies, whether they are internationally or located in those countries of origin or our own Department of State are putting some hurdles and challenges. I would say that currently there's been a change in who's leading the Office of Children's Issues. And we're hopeful that there is some light at the end of the tunnel, Mm -hmm. because I think it's important that the director or the advisor who leads the issues on our level as a central authority is supportive of intercountry adoption. And I think we're definitely at a better place today than we were two years ago. Right. And what are the countries that you're working in and what are the countries that are kind of the major, you know, senders to the U.S. for international adoption? And can you talk just a little bit about what the typical child looks like who is in an intercountry adoption right now? Sure. So Spence Chapin works in South Africa, Bulgaria, and Colombia as the primary provider. Mm-hmm. But we offer services to all families around the country should they choose to adopt from other countries around the world. You know, the children who are listed on the adoption registry for intercountry adoption and who are available for intercountry adoption usually are older children mm-hmm. with special needs. Special needs, yeah. And those needs can be 
varying in degrees from medical special needs to cognitive delays. So there are significant special needs in most of the children that we do place. Yeah. And with the reduction in international adoptions, we haven't yet seen, though, a commensurate rise in domestic adoptions, have we? No, we have not. In fact, those numbers continue to decline. And our stats show that those numbers are dropping as well. There are various factors that attribute to that, including the decreased birth rates in the U.S., but certainly also just adoption as not being a viable option that's ever discussed within a child welfare setting. So, in fact, we're discouraged here to talk about adoption because reunification is the first and foremost concept that's brought to birth families um, while considering all options adoption is never on that list. So, so this, is, this is kind of a crude formulation, but if you see adoption as kind of supply and demand, you're mostly sort of saying that it's not that Americans generally, parents don't want to adopt. It's actually that there are not a lot of children who are available to adopt, at least through this through private adoption, and certainly not a lot of infants who are available for adoption. Yeah. And, and, and obviously, I think there's also, it used to be that if you were a, a single woman who was pregnant, there was probably more cultural pushing for you to consider. Shame. We call that shame. Yes. (laughs) Yes, shame. (laughs) Around being a single mother was not something that one did. And I think that's fundamentally changed, which is probably contributing to why there are less babies available for adoption. I also think that education is key. It's this myth that foster care and adoption are the same thing, or foster care and private adoption are Mm -hmm. the same thing. So it's the very beginning of, you know, when a woman is in crisis and not being aware of that option of choosing adoption, especially open adoption, Mm -hmm. an opportunity to select a family, to have a relationship, an ongoing contact and relationship with the child and the family. I think those are key components that are not being shared nationwide. So Mm -hmm. adoption is often viewed as another form of foster care. So automatically there is a reaction to, I don't want to deal with the system, whatever that system is, or I don't want to deal with the caseworkers. I don't want to deal with ACS. So I think that that you know, debunking that myth is critical to moving adoption at the forefront and center of conversation. There has to be a shift that takes place because a lot of people still think about adoption as something that is not only the product of shame, but also something that's been coerced, that, you know, a woman has been sort of forced into this position. And I think Spence Chapin and and a lot of the other adoption agencies that I've looked at really are trying to sort of turn this into a, you're making a positive choice, you know, for your child, for yourself trying to give them better life. I know that there are people who are sort of trying to change the language around adoption to make it not about giving up a child, but, you know, about putting a child in a in a better position than you're able to provide for them right now. So, you know, I think it seems like it requires a whole cultural change, language change, just really revisiting this and not just, you know, I think this is like across the political divide. I mean, Absolutely. It's, it's, I think conservatives, you know, have sort of embraced the pro-life ethic and are saying to women in crisis, you know, you can handle this, we'll help you, you know, we'll provide as much support as you can, which is great, you know, to the biological mother. And liberals are saying, you know, look, there are other choices here, you know, maybe abortion is one of them. But I think on both sides, adoption has become the last possible option. Absolutely. You know, and I also think there's this perception that if one goes to an adoption agency, they're going to be forced, they're coerced. But in the case of Spence Chapin, something like 60 to 70 percent of the birth mothers that come to Spence Chapin end up actually parenting. And what's interesting about that is it's ultimately they're making the decision. But either way, they've actually been benefited by the counseling that they've received. So if they've chosen to become a parent, they're much better informed about what it's actually going to take to be a successful parent. And if they choose an adoption plan for their child, then they've also had a huge amount of agency over who the parents ultimately are, what their ongoing relationship is. These are unbelievable opportunities that most young women don't even realize exists when they face the situation. And I agree with that. And Ian, just to add on to what you said, I think that the coercive element is so huge in amongst even the professional stakeholders that are working in the child welfare system and shifting that understanding would be a great first start. 
to making adoption a relevant notion in, in, in the community. Well, you mean that it's coercive inside of the public system. You say, Are you saying that they're giving the impression that it's coercive in the private system too? Both. I think that that's the key because you have attorneys who are working who, let's say you have a child abuse neglect Article 10 proceeding that's mm-hmm. filed in court and you know that your client had six or seven prior termination of parental rights. And the chances of him or her or this family fully rehabilitating or getting their child back are really slim. Why not have a conversation about adoption? Right. And, you know, the idea is that the concept is, well, it's coercive. It feels like, you know, it's a quick pro quo situation because they're in this vulnerable place. In addition to, you know, I want to work with my client to make sure that they have all their best options to be able to reunify with their child. Right. The reality is those things will not happen. And it's all at the expense of the child or the children. So while we care about due process and zealous advocacy, we often forget what's at stake here. And right. And those are the children. Keeping the relationship between the children and the biological parent, if a biological parent and an adoptive parent can reach that yes. decision outside of a courtroom and outside of that adversarial process, you know, there seems like there's a much better relationship in the long term for a continued visitation and all sorts of things between the biological parent and the adoptive parent than if you just do the whole thing through the foster care system. Absolutely. And I think that's the key to what Spence offers is adoption competent clinicians and staff who are able to walk families through the process of what it would feel like to, you know, after you do place and adoption is finalized, what it would feel like to meet again, to have a child understand that this is a birth mother and these are my parents. And what does that feel like? And how will that unveil itself over time? And Mm -hmm. I think within the foster care system, you have case planners who are overburdened, overworked, who are not trained to have these conversations and who have no idea what it's like, even post-adoption within foster care, to create a safe space for the children or the child to visit with their birth family. It's like, you know, you you know, one of the stories I remember from my work at Family Court Legal Services as an attorney is that a child who was adopted as a young teenager runs into his birth mother on the street and doesn't know what or or how to interact with her because he's never been taught. Right. He's never been allowed to be in a space to say to him that Yes, you have been adopted. These are your parents. But yes, your birth mother lives in this local community. Wow. And this is what adoption means. Yeah. So, so to offer that, that support and, and, after the fact. And Kate, can you, just to give another sense of how far away this is from an adversarial relationship, talk about the whole area of interim care and how that's such a huge support for a birth mother in crisis. Yes. Thank you, Ian. So interim care at Spence Chapin is really a unique service that we offer at Spence Chapin. It is a service almost like respite care, but not quite. We train volunteers who are trained and prepped by Spence Chapin to take care of the infants who are placed temporarily in their care while a birth mother contemplates the plan around adoption and or parenting. It's not a full and final relinquishment of parental rights, but what it does for any birth parent clinically gives them an opportunity to step back and really assess, how does it feel not to have this child with me? This is what it would feel like, and I'm okay with that, or I want to ask for the child to, I'm not okay with that. So either way, it's a, it's a creation of space, safe space for the birth parent. It's also a continuation of being bonded and attached to an individual, an adult. And we, we, when we place a child into an interim care home, it's the same interim care home for the duration of the case. Which could be how long? Could be anywhere from, you know, we've had children who are placed for 30 days and those who've been placed for six months if, if they're in our special needs program. Uh-huh. And, it, and that entire time, the birth mother has not given up custody of the child. Right? That's Very right. Important. That's right. And, and they're contemplating and they're thinking about it and they're meeting with their independent counsel, which is another highlight for Spence Chapin. We assign independent counsel to each birth parent. And it could be separate, one for birth mother, one for birth father. And counsel is not someone who's just listed on a roster. These are attorneys who are experts Mm -hmm. in the field of adoption, 
relinquishment of parental rights. They're all qualified members, fellows of the American Academy of Adoption Attorneys. And essentially, they work with the birth parent to really engage them and help them understand their rights. And they're there to be part of the process, completely and fully independent of Spence Chapin. We wanted to take advantage of having you here. We we often try to look at pieces that have been in the news that are related to child welfare or education or things that are affecting kids. And so I think many people may have read this piece in the New York Times by Genia Belafonte last week, which talked about, well, the, the title was, Why Aren't There More Rich Foster Parents? And I think people may have read this article and they may have said, are you kidding me? <laughs> Just got to get that in there. Um, but, I, but I wonder, you know, if you could offer your reaction. It, it sort of talked about how we have this nationwide shortage of foster parents. It's certainly here in New York. Why aren't there, isn't there more kind of income class diversity there? Why aren't more people who seem like they're in a better position, at least financially and in terms of probably their family stability level, interested in doing foster care? Well, in my opinion, I think that specifically for New York, the the model has shifted so much, the child welfare model, where the focus of ACS and the commissioner has been really around the preventive services model. Generally, across the nation, there's been a a big undertaking to place kids with kinship relatives. So, you know, those two reasons are really, I think, are the major factors and not sort of casting a wider net, if you will, for other foster parents. However, well, it's kind of a chicken and egg thing right. here. Like if you, you know, if you if you're casting your net, if you're focused on kinship parents, then maybe you're not recruiting foster parents. And then you're claiming there's a shortage of foster parents, but you haven't put your efforts there. That's true. I think in New York specifically, the number of children who are entering foster care has decreased dramatically because of the preventive services. I mean, we went from 20,000 children in foster care to barely 9,000. Yeah, 9, is, so, is that the right metric for us to, like that? on one level, that sounds impressive, but should all 11,000 of those children been kept in their current situations as opposed to being adopted? Well, I, I think as opposed to being in foster care. So mm-hmm. not, necessar- not necessarily in if you're placed in foster care that you will actually wind up with a goal of adoption. You may stay in foster care for a while and age out. Right. And I think that's the, the critical piece for me that the, the number of children who are entering the foster care system is, is a much smaller number, which means that those cases that are coming in are really egregious. That there, means yeah. that the children who are being removed have a number of issues. So, you know, there are two sides of this, of this article that I'm sort of seeing. Yes, yeah, certainly all families should be considered for the foster care licensing. And there's definitely a process that could be really challenging and overwhelming. But I do think that there's something to say about having an intense prep when you're dealing with children who are coming from homes that have been severely abusive and neglectful, where there are histories of replacement over the years where, you know, the issues that they're coming with are severe. So it doesn't take away from the need to prep and to intensify case management, if you will. I think the question is, who's prepping the foster parents? Who's overseeing them? Are they qualified staff who are experts in sort of assessing these needs and really helping the foster parents to thrive with this child or these children in their home? Or is this just a robotic Right, we're going through the motions. And, you know, that's what takes away from really supporting the foster care community. Yeah. But I think there's a, you know, there's a cultural issue too, which is here, you know, is your typical middle or upper middle class family going to be interested in foster care or going to feel prepared like they should be for foster care? I mean, I think, you know, everybody talks these days about, you know, helicopter parenting and hothouse parenting and this whole idea that, you know, everyone's got their little Einstein that they're training, you know, to get into the best college, whatever. I mean, you and know, this you're going to break that up. By right. I mean, especially if you have I mean, if you already have biological kids in your home that you're that this is how you're parenting them. And then you bring in a child who has experienced all these things. I mean, you know, can you imagine what they're going to talk to? To your kids about, you know, let alone the fact that you are going to suddenly have to explain to, you know, the Joneses or whoever in your community that you, you know, have a 16-year-old with severe behavioral problems who's now living in your house. Like that is, you know, the way we have sort of segregated as a society, you know, is in terms of class and it was also in terms of our parenting styles. And so, you know, this I think is maybe, you know, too much of a leap for, for some parents. 
No, I, I, I definitely agree with that. And I think that it's an individual experience. And I think you, it's hard to put things into one bucket or the other. Dealing with a child, besides all the things that you've described, but you have a child who's been in the foster care system for a while, you're not only dealing with the day-to-day issues and, you know, the expectations of the assigned foster care agency, you're also dealing with the law and regulations. You know, most of these children AWOL. Yeah. And what, what does that feel like and what does it look like for a family that's functioning at a certain kind of level and this be thrown kind of, into that kind of crisis it, mode on a regular basis. Right. Yeah. So I think there's something to say for categorizing that not all affluent foster parents are being recruited in the same way than families or foster parents who are lower income families. Right. I mean, honestly, if there if there was a way to more normalize, you know, domestic infant open adoption like the way it's done through Spence Chapin maybe those choices that a birth mother is considering would include adoption from the first place that could avoid some of these these foster care issues down the road. Yeah, that are more problematic. All right. Well, that is all the time that we have for today. Thank you, for, Kate. That was you, very informative. Are you kidding me? Like, that was great. That thank was, you for having me. That was um, very wonderful. So thank you, uh, Ian. Um, so I, again, am Naomi Schaefer Riley. I'm a resident fellow at AEI. And Ian Rowe, a visiting fellow at AEI. You can listen to our podcast, Are You Kidding Me? Uh, you can find it on the AEI's website. It's released the second and fourth Wednesday of every month. And you can get it wherever you get your podcast. So thanks again for joining us. And Kate, what's the URL for Spence Chapin? SpenceChapin.org. Yeah, check it out. Fantastic. Thank you. Thank you.